Welcome to this session on organizational uh, resilience. Uh, today what we are going to be uh, doing is taking you through this, uh, uh, this whole new concept of organizational resilience and in a very simple manner what it's all about. When we talk about organizational resilience, this is a theory which has started to emerge very, very recently. And uh, the reason why it, uh, it started to gain some importance is because organizations per se are very important parts of economies of every country. This was recognized by uh, countries such as uh, Australia to begin with because their economy is highly dependent upon uh, the, uh, the tourism or mining. Uh, now, in, the, in both the cases in Australia, the mining industry or the tourism industry are impacted by fluctuations uh, which are beyond their control. But the organizations in the mining or in the tourism business must also be resilient and they must survive despite the fact that these will be cyclicity in the markets. So what the Australian government did was they went to the universities, the academia, and they were uh, entrusted to find out what actually makes organizations resilient. And that started giving up a totally new concept and the other uh, nations such as the UK, the US, they themselves started to, to undertake research to find out what organizational resilience is all about. Organizational resilience is not to be confused with just risk mitigation or business continuity and definitely it is not about disaster recovery. That's a traditional way of looking at uh, resilient organizations. That means if there is a fire in a building then it should be able to uh, recover and come back to normal. When we are talking about organizational resilience, it is not what happens to an organization but what an organization does with what happens to it. And when we start look around some of the examples in the past uh, regarding organizational resilience, some examples which come to my mind are like Toyota. Uh, now Toyota was a highly successful car manufacturer in the United States and they started to gain market share. But all of a sudden they hit a, a speed breaker and what happened was that uh, they had a lot of quality problems, especially recalls, due to safety issues, especially things with malfunctioning airbags. But how did Toyota respond to that uh, challenge? Uh, would they uh, take the challenge head on? And they did. And they not only used the challenge to become, to come out of that much better, unscathed, but also they made sure that they learned the lessons and those lessons are well, well learned. Another company that I would like to mention is Accenture. Accenture was Arthur Anderson and when you all know that Arthur Anderson faced a whole lot of problems when uh, they were embroiled with the uh, uh, ethical issues at Enron and uh, Arthur Anderson were the auditors there and en uh, together with Enron Arthur Anderson had to vanish. Uh, however, Arthur Anderson uh, got renamed and uh, came out in a different avatar and that's the uh, Accenture of today that we know. And look at the size of Accenture. Globally, they become one of the most reputed organizations once again. Um, so that's how they actually learned the lessons and not only did they survive, uh, but they also prosper. Another example uh, is of IBM. IBM, as all of you would, have, would remember, was very, very, very well known for their mainframe computers. And that was a time when computers used to be the size of this, this room and even larger. And, um, but uh, going forward came the mini computers and then uh, of course the desktops. And I, st I do remember that um, when I was a student at college, the computer used to be an ICL uh, 9000 it used to be in those days. And that was a third generation computer, it took a huge big uh, room uh, for the computer to be and it had a computing capacity which is lower than the any of our uh, uh, notebook computers or laptops that we use uh, on a daily basis. So there were changes which IBM started to perceive and instead of uh, fighting those changes or believing that they, the 
mainframe computers were the future, they actually went away from manufacturing hardware and they have reinvented themselves so dramatically that they do not manufacture or sell any hardware anymore. And what are they? They are a pure solutions company based on services. This is another example of what the company does, an organization does, with what happens to it. So this, these are the kind of examples of organizational resilience. Now what is organizational resilience about? So let's define organizational resilience. It is the ability of an organization to anticipate, prepare for and respond as well as adapt to incremental changes and also uh, be able to sustain sudden disruptions in order to survive and prosper. That is the definition of organizational resilience. And if you just focus on some of the words, it is uh, talking about the ability to survive disruptions. That is quite natural. But also the ability to anticipate and to respond to incremental changes. Those are the kind of things that uh, organizations uh, are not so very clever in uh, understanding. Yeah, let me sh share the analogy. If you have a frog and you put that into a pan of boiling water, what do, what do you think is going to happen? The frog will immediately sense the hot water and jump out of the pan. But if you do the same thing and you take a frog and you put it into a pan of normal water, the frog will be pretty happy to be in water. And you slowly heat the water. As the water heats up, the frog gets accustomed to the increasing heat and the temperature, probably finds it nicer, and, and it continues to adjust itself until the temperature is so hot that the frog will die in the uh, pan of water. Now, this is exactly what the uh, adaptation to incremental changes is all about. Do we, like in the second case, um, where the frog just and does, not, uh, uh, does not respond to incremental changes, but adapts itself to the incremental changes, how does that impact the organization and business? Charles Darwin had an absolutely brilliant uh, idea and he said it is not the strongest of the species that will survive it is the one that is most adaptive to change that will survive and when you talk, think about organizations it is as relevant to organizations as it is to human beings or any other species so when you talk about organizational resilience one mustn't forget these famous words of uh, Charles um, uh, what we also have started to notice is, in, within organizations of today, the luxury of uh, uh, being prosperous, the luxury of being a successful, profitable business with growth is challenged. And the challenge is because there is so much of competition and global competition. And this competition is ever increasing and in certain sectors it is hyper competition. Uh, what I'm going to, to show you is um, the, the actual fact about the companies which are on an S&P 500, Standard and Poor 500 index. Those are the top 500 companies listed on stock exchanges. If you go back to 25 years ago, uh, uh, or uh, a little bit further, and you go down to back to the 1960s, what one would notice is that the average life of an organization who remains as part of the S&P 500 index was as much as 60 years. But if you go back just 25 years from, uh, from uh, now, in, into the mid 80s, the average life came down to 25 years, but still not too bad. And if you analyze what's happening nowadays, the average life of a company to be on an S&P 500 index is just 
seven years. So what has changed is that the challenges have very, become very different. Organizations must reinvent themselves. They must respond to incremental changes. They must, of course, be prepared for sudden disruptions. So all of these things start making sense because you know the success, or the prosperity of an organization is entirely in their own hands, and they can they can build organizations which have the ability to be resilient. Now, I will take you back into understanding organizational resilience from a different perspective. Let's take some of the famous examples that we have been witnessing over these last few years. Uh, let me take some Indian examples. First, let me start with a brand called Maggi, Maggi noodles. Yeah, this was having a tremendous success in India and all of a sudden Maggi was embroiled in a, a food uh, safety uh, issue and they were literally banned from selling any noodles in any part of India. So what started in a small way impacted Maggi to such an extent that uh, crores worth of Maggi which was on the shelves had to be recalled and a large amount of that was destroyed, some of it was put into cement kilns to be burned and so on. So it was a disaster for a brand as strong and as, as uh, large as Maggi. But when you come back today, uh, there, no mother is going to hesitate to open up a packet, packet of Maggi noodles and feed it to her children, knowing very well that Maggi is a safe food. How did this transformation happen uh, in a span of a few months? This happened because the way Maggi responded to that particular incident and how it actually came out of it. And that is exactly the meaning of uh, how a company survives a sudden disruption. But then you, let's take another example of uh, Nokia. As you all know, and if you could just go back 10 years um, uh, before, you know, all of us were roaming around with Nokia phones. And um, Nokia was globally the market leader in uh, selling phones. And where is Nokia today? Now, although Nokia is, as a brand, is trying to come back, but Nokia as a company itself almost sold out its entire businesses and if you know that the phone business of Nokia was sold off to uh, Microsoft who tried to make uh, it to revive it but it wasn't very successful. Why did that happen? Why did Nokia, Nokia lose um, its position? It lost because it did not sense the incremental changes. Why? Because they were so so arrogant about the success that they were in. They were so arrogant about their products they thought that this is the product. They were not thinking about what other companies who were comp com competitors to them were doing. The other competitors were looking at what the needs are of the customers of the markets and they were building products, designing products which would meet those needs and those costs and which Nokia failed to look at that and all of a sudden Nokia lost its uh, business and it just dropped like a rock. Another very famous example is Blackberry. Just five years ago, I still recollect, one of my colleagues actually asked me, you know, that, you know, why don't you buy yourself a Blackberry because every chief executive, every managing director, any person, any manager of any standing has a Blackberry in their hand. And they would swear by the Blackberries. And that was the status of Blackberry. Where was and where is Blackberry uh, now? Uh, they're almost extinct. They're not able to claw back and there was loyal customers and you know just a year and a half ago or not even a year and a half, uh, just a few months ago my own boss Howard uh, David Hollock actually possessed a Blackberry and he still sold by his Blackberry he didn't, wouldn't want to let go of his Blackberry. That's how famous and how popular that company was. Now where are they today? They're completely gone. Nobody would even want to buy a Blackberry because the others have completely bypassed them. One more example of the frog which did not sense the, the heated water which was happening to it continuously. And of course we do hear of other uh, famous examples of Kingfisher, the Wellspun and so many other examples which keep repeating itself with such regularity that one wonders how is it that we don't learn lessons? And this is what organizational resilience is all about. Learn, 
to, if, to do things in the right way to take the challenges of today in order to survive and prosper for tomorrow. At BSI, we recognize this because we created a standard, the BS 65,000 and <clears throat> what we did was we, did, we conducted three researches and those three researches were very insightful. The first research was conducted together with the Economist Intelligence Unit, EIU. And it surveyed uh, many companies, in fact it were over 400 companies surveyed all across the world and there was a very, very high um, level of participation and responses. And what was the survey revealing was that 80% of the respondents felt that it was a business priority. That means they understood the value of a formal good approach towards organizational resilience. 80% um, believed that it was absolutely an essential for long-term growth. And a good 61% believed it created competitive advantage. However, just under 30%, 29% to be precise, actually said that they were using and embedding those good practices to make their organization resilient. So there is something that was a message coming out from this uh, survey. The survey also revealed that the chief executives was the main person who was responsible to, to have organization, resilient organizations. Again, a message which says that it is not the it is not a management representative. It's not a junior person, but it, this particular if an organization has to be resilient, it is the fundamental duty of the chief executive to ensure that the organization remains. There's a nice story that I'd like to uh, recount to you. Um, a lot of you have heard, and most of you would have heard of Fukushima Daiichi. That was the nuclear plant in Japan and due to the tsunami and um, uh, the whole plant was impacted and of course uh, two of the four nuclear reactors actually became unstable and the containment exploded. Now that is a very very dangerous situation for nuclear plants to be. And this evolved, uh, as it evolved the whole world watched what was happening at Fukushima. Most of us had not heard and probably even now have not heard of Fukushima, Fukushima Daiini which was a sister plant owned by the same company on the same coastline as the Fukushima Daiichi plant identical in construction with, the, with respect to the four reactors identical seawalls, identical uh, support systems and the auxiliaries and the fallback systems. But we don't hear about, about Daini and the reason why we don't hear about Daini is because the nuclear reactors, although impacted in the identical manner as Daiichi, they did not they did not go critical, they did not blow the roofs off the containment and there was no accident. All the four reactors were brought down into safe operating conditions and that happened mainly due to the people who worked at the, at the plant. So there was a difference in the cultures, the organizational cultures between the two plants. And you can see how one plant sustained the same impact and the other plant just could not and see the disaster that was created. This is a very, very good story and a good example of what resilient organizations can achieve. BSI started to think about resilience and they started building around uh, the what would make an organization resilient and what are the most important uh, parts and the thoughts that an organization should consider. And this particular model that BSI evolved rested around the businesses of today and what, what we said was, when you look at a resilient organization, you must consider the, the, uh, the product or the service. Then we have the processes that create the product and service and the people who run the processes. 
So when we're looking at organizational resilience, we must actually be looking at all three. We must look at the product and service, we must look at the processes, and then we must look at uh, the people who produce it. But not just that. Yeah? We also must look at three very important domains. Of course, the first one domain is about yeah, having operational resilience. That means these are day-to-day -day activities. These are, these are the actions and the activities and the, the processes that we do on a daily basis. They have to be built to be resilient. Um, and also, we must be looking at information resilience because information is the new um, is the new oil, as they say, which really means that uh, information is the new currency by which companies can be successful. So informational resilience is the second part of the domain that we speak about. And of course, most organizations today, and increasingly so, depend on others uh, to, as suppliers. The suppliers can supply components, but also they supply a good amount of uh, processes uh, as a service to the parent organization. So these are the three ingredient domains which are absolutely vital for a resilient organization in today's business environment. And of course, when we talk about these, we must also understand that an organization which must be resilient has to have three characteristics. Firstly, yeah, it must be able to adapt. Yeah, it must be prepared to change to the changing uh, environment around it. It must be agile. That means you don't wait till you know you're you're almost dead. But you must be agile. You must be quick, and you must react immediately and take actions. And your organization, of course, must be robust. Being robust is a given in today's business environment. So. An organization has to be considering its products and services and the processes that bring about those products and services and the people who manage and use those processes. The, the organization must be robust. It must be prepared to be adaptive and not just be prepared to be adaptive but it must be agile as well. When you put all of that together with the three dom domains that I spoke of, of operational, the informational, and the supply chain resilience, we would be thinking that we, have, we would have a resilient organization. And of course, around all of these are the various processes that we, we are familiar with, uh, starting with governance and accountability, the leadership, the strategies, the systems, the processes, the culture, uh, the reputation, um, and so many other things, including information security, business continuity, all of these things. And not to forget the importance of safeguarding people, the safeguarding life, safeguarding the environment. All of these things come together all around this, which we are more familiar about, uh, with. But going, going forward, what we also realize that uh, if an organization must actually bring to life this very simple concept, yeah, we must break it down into chunks. And breaking it out into chunks makes implementation and the journey much more easy and navigable for companies. In our own wisdom, yeah, and we actually in a team derived 16 key elements yeah, which are governance and accountability, leadership, vision and culture, the vision and purpose, culture, horizon scanning, alignment and so on and it goes straight through financial as well as the community engagement. All these 16 elements have been determined as the, the most important ones which an organization should not uh, fail to address and consider. Here I'm showing you an iceberg. An iceberg, as most of you would know, has only a seventh of it, one seventh of the iceberg is visible to us which is above water. That means six sevenths and the good majority of that iceberg remains beneath water. The analogy of the iceberg fits very well with what I'm going to tell you. What we see above the waterline are all these uh, processes and activities uh, which includes uh, what I just now spoke about, 
you know, the strategy, the vision, the purpose, and the technology, the products, the business continuity, and information security, horizon scanning, all of these are some things that we understand. These are some things that we can see within organizations. These, these are things we control in organizations. These are above the waterline. This is what we can see. What is the thing that we can't see so clearly is beneath the waterline. And this, this is all about people, the people who are within organizations, the people. And when you talk about people, yeah, you, you know, it is, it's very easy to understand. We are very illogical at times. We are irrational at times. We are emotional at times. And when you put all these together, you know, then we have people who could be pretty much doing whatever, whatsoever they want. So if you want to have a resilient organization, what you also need to be very aware of is the, the, the impact that people have on the organization and its resilience. So therefore we should be looking at the people, the culture. And when we talk about uh, people's culture, we definitely talk about the values, the behaviors, the attitudes, the perceptions, and the feelings. These are all things which are, uh, which one must understand and appreciate are very, very important and which makes a difference in organizations. So uh, to looking at the people is very, very uh, necessary. And believe me and trust me, because with my own experience, I know that the people are the most difficult to build the culture with. And once, but once you have good organizational culture, uh, everything is uh, is very different and very, very successful. We also went through another uh, uh, work, which is the Cranfield Research. And the Cranfield uh, Research was an interesting part of what BSI went around. We actually engaged Professor uh, David Delia, who already was working on organizational resilience at Cranfield University. So BSI, uh, got him to do a research along with his assistants on organizational resilience uh, and being an academician he came out with a very different concept. He didn't go out for another survey, he didn't go out to the companies but what he did was he, he looked at all the research papers which are available and he found about 850 odd research papers out of which he found 650 odd research papers which were very much aligned to the concepts of organizational resilience. He and his team started to dig into that and they started to find out what are the kind of behaviors that uh, actually change, make organizations resilient. So he, what he did and he came out was a very interesting uh, concept. What he found was that over a period of time, organizations firstly, to become resilient, the first things that they would start to do is implement systems, formal processes, formal procedures, and they look at systems. And that actually is uh, controlling and, uh, and improving is how systems work. And by using systems, organizations become better, but slightly resilient. But that's not the end of it. The next activity an organization should do is to build cohesion and that is the cultural cohesion and that actually helps through anticipating and responding to a problem. That means lessons learned, how do we actually improve upon what we have learned and make a resilient organization. Going forward, the organizations then need to be looking at becoming efficient uh, and that is the process rigor. That means effectiveness and efficient organizations. And how do you do this is by improving and uh, uh, at execution the discipline around all of this. And that, that makes organizations more resilient. And after which organizations have been found to start to implement adaptive actions. That means they now start to look at problem solving and innovation and that is the adaptive action that organizations do and they become much more resilient but the most resilient organizations they demonstrate something more than just these four 
those resilient organizations have built in a culture and thinking which is called paradoxical thinking. And this paradoxical thinking means that balancing and managing tensions. And what he also discovered, and very rightfully so, when you look at organizations, they could either be progressive or they can be defensive. Tensions can also be flexible or they could be highly consistent, inflexible. At any given moment of time, organizations can think that, oh, I am very progressive and I am very innovative, and that is like a Google. They will say, you know, I am flexible, I am progressive, and uh, yeah, but that's not the only answer. An organization needs also to have some consistent processes. They need also some consistency. They also need to be defensive. They need to be, you know, what they do well, they should also be able to keep it in such a way that others do not steal their ideas and their uh, technology or their, their uh, innovations. So organizations must not just think that they, can, they lie in a progressive and flexible, but they also need to be, in some parts of the organization, needs to be also considered that they need to be progressive, but at the same time they need to be consistent. They also need to be consistent, but at the same time they also need to be defensive. And they need to be flexible at the same time they also need to be defensive. And when you look at that concept, uh, these are the four activities which are mapped, which is the cultural cohesion, the system strength, the process rigor, and the adaptive actions. These are the four distinct uh, behaviors within organizations, but then it is not one uh, formula. It is not one of this which is the best. An organization must implement all the four. Yeah. To what degree it implements? That can vary, but at some time or the other, this particular kite that you see in the red here, you know, that can change its shape according to the changing needs of the business, the changing co competitive and the business environment around that, changing technologies and so on. So that is what the, the Professor Denier discovered, that the most resilient organizations would be like an amoeba, ready to <coughs> change themselves, to flex themselves, and but at the same time, they would be in all the four quadrants at the minimum, and they do have this paradoxical thinking. A very, very interesting concept. Organizations who, which fail to, to even think about is like this image of this, this young man on a bright, nice, sunny day, uh, rowing away, has um, something in his ears indicating that he may be listening to some music so he cannot hear the, the impending waterfall uh, and merrily uh, sleepwalking into disaster. And this is the case of a large majority of the organizations that we see around the world. And only the few, the very, very few today have actually been thinking about having resilient organizations. Although, as you saw in that survey, 88% of the CEOs do be, want to have resilient organizations. And you can see why they have this challenge and the problems. The same thing which we have done was that we have plotted, the, uh, we have plotted a real company on two parameters, on the 16 elements that I just described to you. So the organization plots itself on where it wants to be on a one to six scale with respect to each element. It does not necessarily have to be six on six for every element. There could be a three on six depending on the type of business and the type of industry sector that that organization functions in. But at the same time, the organization must also understand where it is today, where it needs to be and where it is. And the gap between the two, where it needs to be and where it is, is the, the it gives the company the idea or identifies where improvements need to be made in order to have a resilient organization. In conclusion, organizational resilience is all about the products the, the, or services, the processes that create the products, the people that run the processes. It's about real benefits and it is built around 16 elements which support the organization to be robust, they support it to be adaptive and they support it to be agile.
That, ladies and gentlemen, is all about organizational uh, resilience.